good good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a smaller crowd as always uh, end of the year it, because uh, a lot of traveling since the school holidays has started, and also particularly uh, a lot of people are sick with uh, flu and COVID. I know a lot of uh, a few of our members uh, who are down with either COVID or flu. Uh, they can't really tell what is what, right? Because all feels alike, all looks alike. So we just want to keep them in prayers. I'm sure they are online. So we are praying for you. And we are, we are still glad you are online with us. And for those who are traveling, you know, safe travels. Um, you know, uh, enjoy your time with family, friends. I think Christmas season, the holiday season, uh, it's, it's really a good time, you know, to get together with family after the, the whole year, uh, the busyness of the year. You know, and it's a good way to end the year with family, with friends. So, you know, have a blessed time uh, traveling. And, you know, always remember the Lord is with you all. And I think that, that is uh, the, the, best, the best time that you can have with family. All right. And we are always praying for your safety in your travels and in your holidays. Um, I have a, a, a one or two follow up announcements. Next week, it's uh, our Christmas uh, Eve. Uh, we don't do it at night, we do it during the Sunday service. It's our Christmas, Christmas Eve uh, worship Sunday. So it won't be like a normal Sunday service. Uh, but at the same time, next Sunday is also baptisms, confirmation and membership transfer uh, in MEC. There are 10 people uh, going through baptisms, membership transfer, uh, and also child, 11, 11 people, all right? So we would give thanks to God. And all these people are from MEC, you know? So when I say they are from MEC, what it means is their first contact is with MEC. They come to know the Lord in MEC and they are getting baptized. Um, there are two child baptisms, two of it are actually my, both of them are my girls actually. <laughs> their first contact is with MEC. So, so yeah, uh, but we give thanks to the Lord for the 11 who are giving their lives to the Lord and also joining us uh, in this family of Christ in Mega CMC slash MEC, all right, because we are not yet a local church. Uh, I also want to, uh, especially, you know, we come to the end of the year, and since next week, I think, after next week, a lot more people won't be around. So I just want to give thanks, you know, and show my appreciation to a very group of, uh, a group of people who have been, been with MEC for a very long time. They are the backbone of MEC. Uh, I've been highlighting various ministries uh, over the different Sundays. This is one group of people that I feel we really need to highlight, and these are the MEC committee. Uh, you know, we have our chairman, Philip. We have... Uh we have Kame, we have Brian, we have Dylan. Um, have I missed out anyone? Jia Chen. Sorry, sorry, Jia Chen. Sorry, because Jia Chen was recently added. You know, sometimes I miss. Now I'm just doing this off the top of my head, all right? Uh, Jia Chen, and I think I haven't missed out anyone else, right? Um, of course, we have a, a, a group of more senior advisors who, who don't always join us, uh, but they are uh, Reverend Pan from Main Sanctuary. Uh, we have Brother Jacob and also Brother Tan Aizeng, all right? Uh, these people are actually the group that, you know, they are the backbone of MEC. Don't think that I make all the decisions and I do everything by myself. Actually, these people, a lot of the things you see happening and a lot of the, the, the ideas that you see coming out in MEC actually comes from all of them. And I think without them, you know, MEC wouldn't be what it is today. So I just want to take this time to thank all my committee members. And I think as uh, worshippers, let's give them a round of applause. Let's thank them for their dedication and their effort. I also want to highlight that next year, Philip will be stepping down as our MEC chairman. He's not stepping down from the church leadership, however. He's still going to remain in the LCEC, which is our church leadership, uh, but he's no longer the chairman of uh, MEC. There will be a new chairman next year, uh, which is uh, Dato Richard Lim. I think most of y'all would know him. A uh, great man of God, a very successful man in uh, the in the secular world as well, I think uh, I think most of y'all would know uh, his uh, his his track record, right? And we are really glad that he said yes to come and lead uh, MEC, and we're really happy uh, to have him on board. But I'm sure Philip will still continue to remain as a worshiper in MEC. Yeah, don't leave us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but we want to thank Philip for the the past seven years, seven years, right? Or even more than that. 
because MEC started way before we were here on Sunday. So it was a very long time. I want to thank Philip for all that he has done, leading and uh, directing uh, our committee and also this congregation. So thank you, Philip. Um, now, um, next week, baptisms. So please come support those who are being baptized. All right. And remember, uh, 25th, for those of you who have bought tickets for the Christmas show, uh, there are two ticket times, so follow your ticket times, all right? Don't, don't buy a 2 p.m. session and then come 10 a.m., all right? There won't be enough seats for everyone. It's not like free seating, okay? Um, if you have bought for friends, remind, remind them uh, to come early, especially for the morning session or even the afternoon session because it's a public holiday. There might be shortage of parking or you might find it really difficult to get parking. So if possible, carpool, or there's an MRT that is actually really convenient. If you want, you can actually park here in KD and take the Surian MRT all the way to Wan Utama. I think the station is called Banda Utama. And actually, you go straight to the, to the place where the, the venue is. So you go in and you just, you just need to take a lift up. So I think it's more convenient if you can to take the MRT, especially if you are going for the 2 p.m. slot, all right? Because that, I think it will be impossible to get parking, all right? So remember your, 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 your show times and do try and turn up on time, all right? But if you cannot make it, it's okay. There's no live broadcast. <laughs> Wait for the next year, okay? <laughs> all right? Um, so that's all for the announcements. Um, today we will continue with our sermon series, Faith over fear. And we are still in the Gospel of John and we will continue to remain in the Gospel of John until we are done with the Gospel of John. And today from the passage of Scripture that we have just read, there are three things that I would like to bring up. And it's really interesting because John spends a majority of the opening introduction of his Gospel speaking about another person named John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, don't confuse John the Baptist with John, the writer of the Gospel of John, all right? So today I'm going to mention a lot of John, so try and pay attention, okay? To John the Gospel writer, John the Baptist. And so John continues to write about John the Baptist and he goes into greater detail about some conversations he had with a group of Jewish priests, Pharisees, uh, as Matthew's gospel uh, would write. You know? So if you look at Matthew chapter 3, there is also a conversation included between John the Baptist and this group of Pharisees. But of course, in Matthew's Gospel, the conversation includes certain more hostile words by John the Baptist towards these uh, Pharisees and these priests. But John's Gospel is a little bit more mellowed down. Because I think John, looking at the way he writes his letter, he, it, 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 it makes sense, right? Because John is a person who preaches about the love of God and how we as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we must have love. And as much as John is speaking out at the, you know, the mistakes or the problems of the Pharisees and the Jewish leadership, he does not want to incite or stir up any sort of you know, ill feelings or hatred towards this group of people. Right? And so that's why you get a sense of why John, he writes in a more mellow manner when he speaks of these Pharisees and these teachers of the law. But then again, he includes some of the things that they brought, some of the questions that they brought to John the Baptist. You know? And some of these questions were actually rather hostile. And John does not leave those questions out because to him is these questions form a very important message uh, describing the ministry of John the Baptist but not only that describing what faith in God truly is and so as we talk about faith over fear for the second time you know in this Christmas season what else can we learn 
right? And just looking at the act of baptism, because that's what John the Baptist is known for, baptism. What are some things that we can relate to our fear, uh, relate to our faith, which then speaks to our Christian life today, right? And the first thing is this, baptism is fear. Now, this is something that you, all of you will find strange. I already see Philip scrunching his face like, hey, my pastor is not right this morning. <laughs> Baptism is about fear. What is he talking about? And bear with me for a moment before you start judging me, all right? Bear with me. There's 30 minutes to a sermon. I just started my first minute or first two minutes only, you know. <laughs> and I just, I'm just kidding. But let's look at verse 19, right? Now, look at this. The priests, the Levites, they came from Jerusalem and they asked John the Baptist this question, who are you? Now, we read it in the English language and we find that it's, it's a very simple question, right? It could be a question because they do not know who he was. Here is this man who is so weird, who, whom we heard a lot of weird, funny stories about him and he's baptizing Right? So that's why we may think that's why they ask this question, but read the question carefully, especially in the original language. And it, there is a tone of hostility, there is the tone of pride, and there is also hints of jealousy in this question. And there is a reason. They are hostile towards John the Baptist because like I mentioned last week, uh, not, not last week, two weeks ago, right? By the way, last week Dylan was preaching and I believe he did a great job for first time preaching in the main service, all right? So he did a good job, all right? Uh, you know, and, and so two weeks ago I did mention that John the Baptist, now some of us might think that he's an eccentric person, right? Just happened to gather a crowd of followers in the desert and people listen to him because somehow he had a good message. And so there he goes, John the Baptist, right? An eccentric Christian man. But he's not. I mentioned last week, John the Baptist, don't look at him as an eccentric person, but think of him as a person who grew up being educated in the ways of a Jewish Pharisee or a priest. This priest, these Pharisees, they actually knew him. They actually recognized this man. And John the Baptist is not an old man like some of you might think. He's a young man at the age of probably early 30s. And there he was in his ministry. But he chose not to minister in a synagogue, in a temple. He chose to minister to the crowds of people in the desert. He chose to not live according to the priestly way of living. You know, in that that, that high class, back in those days, being a priest, being a Pharisee, it's a, a different class of living, right? It's a better way of life. And every young man was striving to be a priest or a Pharisee because of the perks that was included with the job. And because once you become a priest, you immediately go up several ranks in the Jewish society. John the Baptist, think of him as someone who was educated, raised up to actually be a Pharisee, a priest, but he chose not to do it. He chose to go into the desert and to simply be himself, but then be a messenger of God. And that is why the priests, the Pharisees were very upset with him. Because here is this man who was supposed to be one of us. But then he left us and in the eyes of the priests and the Pharisees, he's way more popular than us. Crowds of people followed him and people listened to his message and he was baptizing people. And so they disliked it. They didn't like what he was doing. Now, there was also a sense of pride in them when they asked John the Baptist, who are you? Because to them is, who are you to be baptizing people? Who are you? You're not one of us. You chose not to be a priest, so why are you then baptizing people? Now, we must not think of baptism as a, an act that only came about later on when the church was more established. Baptism was actually a common practice among the Jews. But the reason or the function of baptism was very different. 
the function of baptism was to baptize Gentiles into the ways of Judaism. And so basically, if you were to baptize someone back in those days, it was not so much a baptism into salvation, but it was a baptism showing your commitment to up uphold the laws of the Jewish nation, to uphold the laws and the, the practices and the traditions of Judaism. It's to be a law keeper and to enter into this, 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 this legalistic way of living. And that was baptism during that time. But here was John the Baptist baptizing people into salvation, baptizing people into repentance and showing them the way to freedom. His baptism was not a baptism into Judaism. His baptism was a baptism into freedom, into repentance. And the Jewish priests and Pharisees disliked, or you can use that word, they hated what John the Baptist was doing. And that is why the priests paid John the Baptist a visit. Because to them is, who are you? to be changing the function of baptism, the, the purpose of baptism to which we hold so dearly, that is to, to convert people to Judaism and that is the only function of Judaism. Who are you to be doing what you're doing, showing people and using baptism as a mode for freedom, spiritual freedom? There was jealousy also, like I said earlier, because the crowds of people came and crowds of people were attracted to the message of John the Baptist. But not just attracted because John the Baptist was a great speaker, not because you know, he, was, he put on a great show, but attracted to his message of repentance and freedom in God. And the priests, the Pharisees were jealous because people were turned away by their message. People did not want to sit in the temple. People did not want to listen to them talk and teach. But people wanted to listen to John the Baptist. And so when they came to John the Baptist with that question, it was a threat to John the Baptist actually, telling him, hey, you either join us, all right, be one of us, do what we do, don't do anything different, be us. And they wanted to tell John, to stop preaching repentance. And that is why if you go to then, if you connect this to Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, you would then understand why John the Baptist goes at these priests and Pharisees with a very strong message. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, and I'll just summarize here. He calls them, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites, who warn you to flee from judgment. Why are you here if it's not for repentance? If you're just here to tell me and give me threats and tell me to join you, do not be different, don't preach repentance, then don't be here. And so John, of course, he responded in that manner. But I also like the way John responded to the priests and the Pharisees. Look at what he says in verse 20. He says this, when they ask this question, who are you? Verse 20 says, he confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Two times, John writes that John the Baptist confessed. The first confession is probably, and, and he says he did not deny. It means he tells the priests and the Pharisees, yes, I'm not one of you. I'm not baptizing and doing baptism the way that you do baptisms. But then he also says this to them. I am not the Christ. And this is a very strong message to the Pharisees. And this message that John says when he says, I am not the Christ, speaks volumes. What he's saying is this, I fear God. I am not like you, who think that you are bigger than God, who, who speak about God, who tell people to fear God. But in reality, you do not fear God yourselves. Because if you fear God, you will not be speaking and doing half of the things that you are doing now. But John says, I am not the Christ because I fear God. And I know who is God. But do you know who is God? I am not the Christ to mean that I obey God as well. You will tell me, do not baptize people into repentance. Baptize people 
into Judaism, but I obey God. And I do as God tells me to. You would tell me to teach and preach about Judaism and not preach and teach about repentance because being a Jew is more important than repentance. But John says this, I am not the Christ. I am the messenger of God and the messenger only preaches what God tells him to preach. I am not the Christ. What a powerful response. When we talk about baptism, is about fear. It means fearing God. For those who are going to be baptized next week, if you are here today, if you are online with us, remember this. The day you put your faith in Christ, the day you believe in Christ, is the day where you fear God. And when we talk about fearing God, what does it really mean? It is not in that literal sense of, I am afraid of God. I have that fear. I'm scared of God. It's not that fear. But the word fear, if you translate it, you know, from its original Hebrew, Aramaic, and and, and then Greek language, it really means a deep reverence, a deep honor. Not just a surface level honor, right? We honor people every day. I honor you, but I don't really have a deep sense of honor for a person, right? Or maybe we do for some people, right? But here, when it talks about fearing God, it's a deep sense of honor towards God. And that is what John had. And that is what John was instilling in the hearts of those whom he baptized. That you need to fear God. And as he spoke to the Pharisees as well, he was telling them, I am not the Christ. You are not the Christ. We all need to have a fear of God. And so what does it mean to fear God? When we talk about a deep sense of honor, what does it mean? It means you remove this thing called self-glorification. You remove your pride and you come before God, humble, just as you are. And you remove all forms of pride. Like in the book of Revelation, also written by John. Not John the Baptist, but John the Gospel writer. He speaks of the elders with their crowns of glory. And when they come before God in worship, they remove their crowns and they fall down and they bow down before God. That is what it means to worship God. That is what it means to fear God. It is to remove our pride. It's not about me. It's not about glorifying myself. It's not about, you know, how well I can preach, how well I can sing. It's not about how well I can talk. It's not about how good I look. It's all about God. It's about removing your pride. And that's what it means to fear, fear God. It's about removing self-gratification, selfishness. When we talk about coming to God in faith, what is our motivation for believing in Jesus Christ? What is our motivation for believing in Jesus Christ? Is it because along the way, someone came to me and said, if you believe in Christ, your bank account will double up in the next week. Is it because somewhere along the way, someone came to you and said, if you believe in Christ right now, you're never going to fall sick? Is it because along the way, someone came to you and said, if you believe in Christ right now, you will have a shift in your current job. You will have a shift in your current situation and your position in life is going to be so different, dramatically different. Is it because someone came to you with a rags to riches story if you put your faith in Jesus Christ? If that is the reason, I'm sorry to say, that is not what Christ will do the day you believe in Him. And we have to remove this concept of believing in Christ, coming to Jesus for something that God can maybe give to me. And if you look at Matthew's gospel, John was very clear with the Pharisees as well because some of them came to John the Baptist saying, hey, John, baptize us, baptize us. 
Since these people, you're telling them, you know, believe, be baptized, and you have a place in the kingdom of God. So baptize us because we want the best place in the kingdom of God. We want a, a prime location in heaven. We want to be right in front of God. Because even in heaven, our position matters. And that's what they wanted. They wanted to be baptized not because of repentance, but they were thinking, if I get baptized now, I may be able to secure a prime location, prime real estate location in heaven. And that's why John told them outright, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the judgment of God? If you're not here for repentance, don't be here at all. Because believing in Christ, repentance, faith, is not about yourself, it's not about what you can get but it's about what Christ has already done for you. And that is what it means to fear God. It, it, it means that even though God gives me nothing in return, even if it means at time God takes away, I will still believe in Him. I will still continue to have faith in Him. I will still continue to be faithful to Jesus because He has given me all that I ever need in my life. It is to remove that, that, that selfish desire out of us and is to come before God with the purest of intentions, knowing that we are in need of salvation and we are in need of the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And that's all we ever need. That is what it means to fear God. And you put on selflessness, like John the Baptist, putting on selflessness, being a servant of God, being a humble servant of God. And when John baptized people into repentance, he's telling them, hey, you put on selflessness. Your life is no longer your own. Your life is to believe for Jesus Christ. I think that is the whole spirit of Christmas, right? Christmas, is, Christmas tells us about Jesus who self, unselfishly came down to this earth to give us salvation. And in that process, like what he tells his disciples, you go and do likewise now. The message of Christmas is not just about what gifts can I get this year? What can the church do for me? What show are they going to put on? Right? But more than just that, the message of Christmas is really about how can I be like Christ? More like Christ. That is what it means to be selfless. And so you have to ask yourself this question. When I say I have faith in Jesus Christ, do I fear God? John, as he talks about baptism, is also about faith. Faith in God. The priest came up to John with a follow-up question. And so they say, why are you baptizing? This is, this is found in verse 25, right? If you are not the Christ, you are not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, who miraculously came back from the dead, if you're not the prophet, the great prophet, that God has prophesied, actually John was the prophet that was to come before Jesus Christ. But John was not one who would go out there and say, hey, I am the prophet. John was someone who just was contented with doing the work of God. And so they say to John, if you're not these three persons, if you're not Jesus, if you're, if you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, if you're not the prophet, then why are you baptizing? Why are you doing all these things? Because you know what? Technically, you can't baptize. First of all, you're not a priest. So if you're not these three persons, then you can't baptize. You are not a priest. Why are you baptizing people if you're not baptizing them into Judaism? Why are you still doing what you're doing? Right? To which John replies them with a very simple answer. Yet another simple answer. He says this, I baptize with water. Now sometimes we read this and we say, oh, John is just stating the, the, the facts. <laughs> right? He's just stating the obvious. Right? It's like someone asks, you're eating rice, you're eating lunch, and someone comes and says, hey, are you eating lunch? <laughs> and then you respond, I'm eating lunch. Right? And it seems like John is just stating the obvious. I baptize with water. Obviously, he was baptizing with water, right? Everyone could see he was there. He was baptizing people in the river. But then why did he have to say that? I baptize with water. 
when he says I baptize with water, there's a lot of meaning in this sentence. What he's telling the Jews, the priests especially, is that I'm baptizing people, but then at the end of the day, it's not me who is pronouncing forgiveness. It is not me who is forgiving them of their sins. It is not me who is convicting them to repentance. It is the work of God. I only baptize with water, but God is at work in the person's life through the Holy Spirit. The Jewish people looked at baptism very differently. It was a sense of authority. It was a way to wield power and control over people. You want to be baptized? Remember this, the moment you go through these waters, you are under my control. You, 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 you commit to obey all the laws that I set, not God, I, the priest, the, I, the Pharisee, I, the teacher of the law that set for you. You are committed to me. This waters hold extraordinary power and if you break any of these laws, God will judge you on my behalf. And now you see the significance of why John says, I baptize with water only. Because I am merely the messenger of God. I have no power to change people's life. I have, no, I have no power to convict people even. It is the work of God. It is the Holy Spirit in the person's life forgiving that person. I do not pronounce forgiveness. I merely baptize with water. God forgives. God's love compensates for their sins. God's mercy brings sinners back into a relationship with Him. And it is all the work of God. Baptism is merely an act that I do to show people the new life in God as a disciple of God. And that is a very powerful message. It speaks volumes about John's ministry. It shows his humility, but it also shows John leading people towards faith, discipling people towards faith in God. Unlike the Jews, the, the, the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees who were leading people through baptism into a certain kind of legalistic bondage and fear, John was leading people through baptism into a life of freedom, a life of faith in God, a life of experiencing the love, the mercy, and the grace of God, bringing people one step closer towards God. When we talk about faith, faith begins when we receive the love of God when we receive the forgiveness of God. That is when faith begins. Faith does not begin only when you are baptized. Faith begins the day you say yes to God and you open up your hearts to Him. Faith also means that you reject the fear that comes from the devil. The fear that comes from the lies of the devil. Or the fear that comes from misunderstanding that I need to work for my salvation. That I need to do a little bit more because I am such a terrible sinner. I'm so bad. I'm, a, I'm the worst person on earth. And this is a lie from the devil saying that God's love is not enough for you. God's love is more than enough for you. Remember two weeks ago we talked about grace upon grace. This is from John's Gospel. Grace upon grace, God gives to you. For all who receive Jesus into their life, grace upon grace. God's love, God's grace is sufficient to cover any sins, any wrongdoings that you might have committed. Faith is also this, that we lead others to God as well. I think this is the best gift that we can give to anyone during this Christmas season. If we can share the hope of Jesus Christ with those around us. It might not be immediately that once you tell, talk to this person and they pray a prayer believing in Jesus Christ, it might not be immediate. But at least like John the Baptist, we avail ourselves to be messengers of hope 
to those whom God brings in our path. That whenever there is an opportunity, we tell someone, let me pray for you. Whenever there is an opportunity, we tell someone, God loves you. Whenever there is an opportunity, we tell someone, Jesus can give you peace. And this is what it means to share hope. We buy gifts for people this Christmas. Let's add something on to the gift that we give to people. Let's add on the message of hope so that more people can find freedom in Christ so that more people can have faith in God. Amen? Baptism at the end of the day, like what John the Baptist preaches, is about repentance. Right? I'm not repeating myself here, even though it sounds like I am. But bear with me, because look at what John says in verse 26. He says this, I baptize with water, and towards the end of verse 26, he says this, but among you stands someone you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now just, let me just sidetrack for a little bit. Verse 27 strengthens the claim on why John the Baptist was trained as a Pharisee. Why, why? It strengthens the claim, it strengthens this claim that John the Baptist was trained properly. He had formal education as a Pharisee because of this sentence that he says, the strap of whose sender I am not worthy to untie. That's back in those days. There is this kind of practice or tradition that a, a priest would have a group of followers like Jesus and his disciples, right? And so it's not uncommon. And usually because this priest is someone more senior, there's some form of ragging going on. And one of the things that they would oftentimes ask the younger up-and-coming priests to do is to untie the straps of their sandals anytime they need to take it off and enter into someone's house. It would also be to the extent of not just untying, but then washing my feet as I enter into someone's house. It could, it's a job of the servant of the house, but then I want you, my follower, to do it for me simply because I have the authority. I have the power to do so, right? And that's why John, he says this, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sender, I am not worthy to untie. And what he's saying is this, Jesus is so holy, Jesus the Messiah who is to come. He is so holy, he is so righteous, that even if he asks me to untie his sandals, I am not worthy to go near Jesus because of the righteous person that he is. But then John says to the Pharisees, I know who Jesus is and I dare not su supersede Jesus. But then you all, you do not know him who is actually standing among you. You do not know him. And when John says this, there is two definitions. Number one is sort of like a prophecy. A prophecy of the reaction of the Jewish leadership who will reject Jesus as Messiah, who will reject Jesus as the prophesied Messiah. They would reject him and he was telling them, you do not know, or more accurately, is, you will not know him even if he's standing among you. Not because he did not make himself known to you, but simply because you refuse to accept Jesus as the Messiah. But when John says this, one that you do not know, he's also saying and pointing out the Pharisees' refusal to repent, to, to do what is right, to change. You are not going to repent. You're not going to change. You, you just want to be stuck in your ways of biasness, of discrimination, of wielding authority, of corruption, of sinfulness. You do not want to change. And that's why when John preaches to the people, to the crowds, and he baptized them, his only message is the message of repentance. Believe, be baptized, and repent. What does it mean to be repentant or to repent? It means to have a transformed life a change of life. 
Sometimes we look at repentance and we don't really understand what it means. Right? We think that it is a very convicting word. We think that it is a word that I don't really like my, my pastor or any preacher to just keep emphasizing on this word. But the fact is this. We as Christians, we who have faith in Jesus, we need to constantly live in repentance. What is repentance? Let me break it down for you. First, it is Jesus in us. You have Jesus in you. You have the hope of repentance. You have the hope of a new life. With Jesus in you, you have hope because what was once impossible now is possible. What you once could not do, which is to turn away from sin, now it is possible in Jesus Christ because not only Jesus in you makes you a Christian on paper, but Jesus in you, it means the power of God, the, the resurrection power, the power of the Holy Spirit in you, pushing you and enabling you and empowering you for holiness. And that is such a beautiful hope that each and every one of us have. So we are not just helpless Christians doing our best, trying to live a life of righteousness, striving for righteousness, but unable to do it. That is a very pitiful picture of a Christian, right? But when we talk about living in repentance, it's possible because Jesus is in you. Jesus is your hope and you can change. You can be different. Because it is not your own strength, but it is the strength of God in you. And that is what it means to live in repentance. But then after that, what does it mean to also live in repentance? It means every day, now you have to make a choice for righteousness. It's like you having the power to do what is right, but also then having the ability to do what is wrong. What are you going to do? And if you choose to say yes to God, if you choose to do what is right, the power of God will be at work in you and the power of God will push you and spur you and inspire you towards righteousness, towards greater righteousness. All you need to do is to constantly make the choice for righteousness. That is what it means to live in repentance. It is great hope. It is nothing convicting, it's nothing condemning. It is great hope. But it, all, it is also a great responsibility to make a choice for righteousness and for God each and every day of our lives. Are we going to do it? Let us bow our heads and let us pray.